你做梦都要做很多，做梦都要一般上几个世纪都来改啊，来做嘛。所以我我等我就死了，怎么等都不能来做，反正。一天一天半，也不行。哇，这人好累哦，那我都走了。Thank you. 
Okay, let's get started then. So, um, last lecture, what did we talk about? We talked about ice nucleation, and so I asked you what temperature ice crystals form. It depends. It has to be less than zero degrees Celsius, that's one thing. One thing I didn't mention is that the supersaturation, when we talked about supersaturation, the supersaturation over an ice surface has to be greater than zero, otherwise ice does not form. That means if you have an ice, ice surface, then water vapour in the air has to be such that <coughs> so that the gradient is such that water vapour molecules will move towards, towards that flat surface. Otherwise, ice cannot form from liquid water. So this is the second criterion. And ice nucleation, we talked about ice nucleation, we talked about the different ways of thinking about ice nucleation. We talked about homogeneous nucleation, we talked about the different mechanisms, heterogeneous deposition where vapour goes directly to the solid ice on, on ice nuclei. We talked about immersion freezing, we talked about condensation followed by freezing, and we talked about contact nucleation. And then the nature of nucleation itself, we talked about people thinking it's a stochastic process, so a statistical process, and people thinking it's a, a singular process that happens at a set temperature every time, a well-defined characteristic temperature. And I had, a, I had a useful question from Langlin at the end, which was how, well, it was to do with the difference between a singular process and a stochastic process. And the question was why, I guess it was why, when you cool, when, when you cool the sample, why do you get more ice nucleation? I think this is right. Why do, you get, why do you get more ice nucleation when you cool a sample from one temperature to another? And um, I guess the explanation is that it's not actually a singular process. It is actually a stochastic process. But we can think about heterogeneous ice nuclei as having these characteristic curves where if you think, so I mentioned stochastic nucleation is such that um, we can define a nucleation rate, omega, which depends on temperature. What, what actually happens is if we have a particle, then that particle tends to have patches on it that have different characteristic omega values. So this patch might have omega 1 versus temperature curve, this one might have omega 2 versus temperature. And these omega curves are very steep, they're like activation functions, they're very steep functions of temperature. So we might imagine as a function of temperature, so this is warm, this is cold, omega looks like this, very steep functions. So it might be that some particles, when we cool them, they approach this curve and they suddenly go. When they approach this threshold, they suddenly nucleate ice. Whereas other particles, when we cool the sample, have to reach this threshold temperature before they go. And that can appear like it's a singular process. Does that make sense? It's just that the threshold for stochastic nucleation at temperatures warmer than this line uh, the, 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 the actual freezing rate due to stochastic nucleation at temperatures warmer than this line is negligible until you get to that line and then it becomes you know, very significant as soon as you cross that line. Does that make sense? So some particles have these characteristic curves, some particles have these character characteristic curves and if we cool the sample you might, you might expect to see the nucleation happen on different particles at different times. So that's how we explain the fact that nucleation is actually a stochastic process, but that the singular description gives a good explanation of the process. Does that make sense? <coughs>
Okay, some people nodding, some people not. Have a think about it. Any questions, let me know. So we also talked about why ice formation in the atmosphere is important. I said it affects the radiative properties of the cloud. It affects precipitation too. It changes the lifetime of the clouds. So this is important when we start to think about weather forecasting and climate change. And so today, I'm going to move on from nucleation now. I want to talk about how the ice crystals grow. First of all, let's look at the kinds of ice crystals that we get in the atmosphere and the variables they depend on. So this is referred to as a, an ice crystal habit diagram. It's the different habits, the different shapes of the ice crystals. And so the graph has temperature on the x-axis and it has supersaturation on the y-axis. I've talked about supersaturation. So this supersaturation, supersaturation is normally represented by the ratio of partial pressure to saturation and vapour pressure. In this case, it's represented with different units. It's represented as an excess over saturation in terms of vapour mass. So you just take your vapour pressure, you subtract the saturation vapour pressure, and you convert that excess vapour pressure to a mass. You can do that by playing around with um, ideal gas laws. So looks something like this, starts off, low temperatures, we tend to get compact shapes and low supersaturations, these uh, thin hexagons. Cool to minus five, start to get more columnar shapes. Goes back to plates, this gets quite confusing. Goes back to plates again and then at higher supersaturations we get columns. At the higher supersaturations again the crystals and minus 15 the crystals become more open, start to develop these branches and even secondary branches so we call these dendrites. And that can happen at, at a look at the higher temperatures too. And at minus five, at high supersaturation, we can get these needles, so really elongated columns. So that's quite difficult to explain. How do we get these transitions between shorter prisms to longer prisms, back to the hexagons again, the shorter prisms, and then back to columns? And the answer is no one really knows. No one really knows what causes these transitions. There's a paper by a nuclear physicist, uh, Ken Librecht, in the United States, and this seems to be his hobby, is to study ice crystal growth in a diffusion chamber. So he's made this diffusion chamber, and he has this website where he posts all these fantastic images of vapor-grown crystals. And he wrote a paper, submitted to the Institute of Physics, to talk about these growth mechanisms and basically the outcome of that paper is we don't really know what causes these transitions but we can explain it by um, by just a fudge factor which is the what we call the deposition coefficient between say the c-axis of this crystal this, 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 this axis and the a-axis do you know what I mean by c and a-axis? No, okay, so I'll try to draw that. So, so for the purpose of this course, all you need to know is if we have a hexagonal crystal, then growth along the C-axis means vapor gets deposited on these faces. So these are the C-axes and growth along the a-axis means growth <coughs> along these facets so this is the a-axis okay. so we can explain the transitions with a fudge parameter which is called the accommodation coefficient or deposition coefficient for how vapour molecules become incorporated into each of these spaces. Okay, and if you read Ken Lebrecht's paper, that's what he talks about. However, 
the reason why it begs the question the reason why these accommodation coefficients change and the ratios between them change as a function of temperature nobody, nobody knows that yet so it's very hard to explain so people tend to tend to come up with these fudge factors to explain it for numerical models that's enough okay so we can make measurements of how ice crystals grow and we can put that information into, into the numerical models and that's good enough to explain how ice crystals grow in the atmosphere but it's a little bit uh, yeah, unsatisfactory why do snowflakes have six sides? well Johann Kepler asked this question in 1611 and he linked the shape of a snowflake to the most efficient way of stacking cannonballs actually wrote an article the six pointed snowflake but he had to wait nearly 300 years before the tools were invented to test these ideas and I'm not really going to go too much into the detail of the crystal structure of ice but um, the people who invented the tools were the Braggs father and son they spent some time at Manchester you know about these guys <coughs> they used x-ray diffraction here's an x-ray diffractometer to probe the crystal structure of ice and they won the Nobel Prize for their work on x-ray diffraction and they collaborated with, with people that confirmed the crystal structure of ice using this technique of x-ray diffraction okay so that was in I think the 1930s actually 1929 I think is when that happened so I mentioned the nuclear physicist Ken Lebrecht at Caltech and he has this web page if you're interested with some fantastic videos and images I recommend if you get time just to go and have a look at some of those and so he's managed to take images he grows these ice crystals in a, a, a diffusion chamber that he built so he puts ice crystals at the center and he has a vapor source and he can cool this chamber down to whatever temperature is interested and you can watch these ice crystals grow so if you go on his web page it talks about all of the different kinds of ice crystals you can get ranging from simple prisms stellar plates minus 2 to minus 15 I guess these are the kinds of crystals and these are the kinds of crystals that you think of when you think of snowflakes so when you get a Christmas card and it has a picture of a snowflake on it, it's usually this kind of crystal, right? Actually, these crystals are extremely rare in the atmosphere. We, we don't see them very much at all. Because they, they need really perfect conditions to grow. Very low turbulence. Some other examples. Fern, like dendrites, very large, greater than five millimeters. Hollowed out columns, so hexagons, hexagonal prisms, where the insides become hollowed out. So that's due to high supersaturations. They, they grow at high supersaturations, high vapor content. So here's some images from Ken Lebrecht's diffusion chamber. Capped columns, these are an interesting one. Our needles I mentioned, capped columns. So this is where you have a column, a columnar ice crystal, that falls into a regime where thin plates grow. So you can see the transition between the two growth regimes. One way you have these elongated columns and one way you have growth along the A axis. Okay. And the result is these capped columns. Bullet rosettes, they're another interesting type of crystal. So these are where you have the temperature has to be less than minus 42. So they're not on that previous habit diagram that I had because the temperature didn't extend to minus 42. So the temperature has to be below minus 42. Um, a solution droplet, so a, droplet, a liquid water droplet, forms on a very concentrated salt particle, which can, they can exist at, high, uh, at low temperatures in the atmosphere. So solution droplets form and then they freeze homogeneously, homogeneous nucleation, in a way that's polycrystalline and that means the, the polycrystal develops facets 
So it's, it's kind of like a quasi-spherical particle with straight facets. And from those facets, because minus 42 is a column regime, we start to develop these columns that grow out from the central hub. And because of the vapor trying to get in and being captured by either side, it tends to thin out the columns either side. So you end up with this bullet shape, like an assemblage of bullets from a growing from a central hub. So yeah, have a look at some of the, the images there on that web page if you get a chance. It is fascinating to see them grow. Before Ken Labrette, there was a, an area of atmospheric science that tried to characterize all of the different kinds of crystals that you observe in the atmosphere. And that led to, I guess, uh, glorified stamp collecting for people trying to classify ice crystals. And one such scheme was this scheme by Magono and Lee. All of these different kinds of ice crystals, and it becomes very complicated very quickly. But all of the different kinds of ice crystals you can get. So uh, we tend not to do that these days. We tend to group them into much fewer categories, maybe you know, up to 10 maximum when we see these kinds of ice crystals. Anyway, I just want to, so, so these images are grown in perfect laboratory conditions, look quite nice. I just want to show you some examples of ice crystals that grow in the atmosphere, so real ice crystals that we've observed from the aircraft. So we fly through clouds and we take images on the aircraft. So this gives you an idea of the scale. This scale here is about 100 microns across. And so these are images taken in a field campaign called, they have all these fancy acronyms, called Emerald One. So these are cirrus clouds. So cirrus clouds form at high levels in the atmosphere. And if you look up in the atmosphere, they're the kind of clouds that, that form a kind of wispy, hair-like structure. In fact, cirrus in Latin means lock of hair. So they tend to look like a lock of hair. <coughs> These are the kinds of crystals we'd see at temperatures less than minus 40 degrees Celsius. So you can see there are some examples of the bullet rosettes. There are some examples of columns. Don't look as nice as the examples that we see in Ken Lebrecht's diffusion chamber, unfortunately. So again, some more examples. Same kind of cloud, a little bit lower down in the cloud. And we can start to see bullet rosettes sticking together. So they start to stick together. That's known as aggregation. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the physics behind how ice crystals stick together later. Okay, so bullet rosettes, they're growing quite large, probably up to a millimetre in size here, maybe a little bit larger. Some more examples there, bullet rosettes, single columns, aggregates of bullet rosettes. So aggregation seems to be, ice, ice aggregation, ice crystals sticking together seems to be an important process. Now slightly warmer cirrus, Cirrus clouds that form at temperatures greater than minus 40 degrees Celsius. So you can see there's, a, there's a, an absence of the bullet rosette. No bullet rosettes now. Obviously, bullet rosettes form at temperatures below minus 42. You can see plates. Plates have these interesting structures on them. So these are hexagons, just imaged at a slightly different angle. Uh, polycrystals, so just crystals that are grown <coughs> maybe aggregated together, or maybe grown like that, due to the turbulence that's present in the atmosphere, and also um, fragments of crystals. So these look like ice crystals are fragmented. They're broken in two, which is an interesting point. Right, so, so the cirrus clouds that I showed you from Emerald One, they are cirrus clouds that form ahead of the front. They're known as frontal cirrus. That means that the cirrus clouds form at the temperature you observe them at, 
and there might be some slight um, sedimentation of the ice crystals, but by and large, the crystals that you observe in Emerald 1 formed more or less at that temperature. Different kind of cirrus is the cirrus that forms from a thunderstorm. So this was Emerald 2. So this is, uh, this is in the Northern Territory in Australia, looking at thunderstorms and looking at the outflow that forms from a thunderstorm. What I'm talking about is you have thunderstorm and then reaches the tropopause and starts to detrain its mass along the tropopause and this is known as anvil cirrus. This is cirrus that forms from a thunderstorm. So a slightly different formation mechanism because a lot of the mass from this cirrus is being transported from, a, from below and when we get to minus 38 or so the droplets, most of the droplets are freezing at minus 38 and being detrained. So you might see some, you might expect to see some differences because the cirrus that forms in situ can form at temperatures below minus 42. But in this case, we see lots of aggregates. <coughs> lots of aggregates, and if you zoom in, it's hard to see from, from the projector, but these are actually plates. So the very thin plates that form at these temperatures, which is consistent with the habit diagram. It is thought that there are more elongated crystals, so chains, than you'd expect to see by chance aggregation in these images. So if you look at how long these aggregates are, they're longer than you'd expect them to be if it was just a random process that was causing these ice crystals to stick together. And people have hypothesized that this is because of the high electric fields that you get from the storms. So they polarize the ice crystals, cause them to align. It's not been proven yet, but that's just a hypothesis. So some more examples from Anvil Cirrus, again, aggregates. Some more. Now a different kind of cloud, this is a cumulus cloud, so much shallower cloud. And here, the temperature is greater than minus 15, and we can see evidence of elongated needles, assemblages of needles. Every now and then we see needles that aggregate, so they're like plus signs. They just stick together like this. That seems to be quite common, more common than you'd expect. Not really sure why that happens. Maybe something to do with our orientation when they fall. But they're also rhymed. Rhymed means that they collect liquid water. So we've got the crystals and we've got liquid water which is accumulated on the crystals. And in cumulus clouds, because they're quite close to the surface and quite a turbulent environment, we often see wind blowing material too. So we often see material that's been picked up from the surface and blown into the clouds. Not really sure what this is, maybe it's some spider's legs or something like that, who knows. <laughs> but again, rind crystal, really long crystals with liquid water stuck on their surface. So it seems to be quite a common thing in cumulus clouds. So some more examples of aggregates there. And again, these, these aren't very nice looking ice crystals. That's the main point I wanted to make. So if you look at, at, at and see how many, what percentage of ice crystals in natural clouds are pristine habits, like in the experiments of Ken Lebrecht, it's less, it, the ones that are pristine, it's less than 5% in the atmosphere. Someone set their alarm <laughs> a little bit late. Um, less than 5% are pristine habits in the atmosphere. So most of them are these complicated aggregates that you'd expect to see. So some more examples. You do see some examples of these fen drives. They're quite rare. Tend to be at minus 15, high supersaturations, and that's all the examples. So 
Okay, so before we move on, I want to talk about some of the theory for how these ice crystals grow, how we can come up with a theory for how the ice crystals grow. So we've done the nucleation, we've done the growth of droplets, now we'll consider the growth of ice crystals. So we're going to consider an ice crystal mass M in a vapour field, water vapour field, and the vapour field is described by rho subscript B which depends on x, y and z. It's a 3D vapour field. So we'll draw a picture. So I've got my hexagonal ice crystal. That's supposed to be a hexagon. Never mind. It's my hexagonal ice crystal. And because it's in a field, a vapour field, vapour can either move towards the crystal or move away. So the vapour field lines should look something like this. Cross that one out. So vapour is either moving along these lines towards the crystal or it's moving away. So we'll consider this ice crystal to be growing. So the vapour molecules are moving along these field lines and going towards the crystal. So rho v that's the vapour density and it has units of kilograms per metre cubed it's the mass of water vapour per unit volume and J will define as a current density of, it's a mass current density of water vapour a vector and has units kilograms per meter squared kg per meter squared per second should be it's like a flux of water vapor so when we considered the growth of droplets, we started with the continuity equation, you remember, back, back a few lectures now. So I'm going to write down a continuity equation. Continuity. Rate of change with respect to time of the vapour density is minus the divergence of the current density. Okay. And the mass growth rate I can get by integrating over a volume both sides of the continuity equation. So mass growth rate integrate the rho v by dt over a volume dip j m dv. And so this is the rate of change of the crystal. We're integrating a density over a volume. And so now I want to say something that the physicists will be very familiar with. Gauss's theorem. Heard of Gauss's theorem? Gauss. Gauss's theorem in that the integral of div j dv is the integral 
of j dot ds. You all familiar with that? This is a an identity, I guess, that Gauss figured out. Integral of the divergence over a volume is the integral of the vector over a surface ds. And so we can write that the mass growth rate, dm by dt, is equal to minus the integral of jm. So this is the general form up here. Now I'm just applying this equation to this. jm dot ds. You see where that comes from? Anyone not see where it comes from? Good. Right, what does JM equal? So we talked about Fick's law, Fick's first law of mass diffusion. JM, remember, was minus the gradient of the vapor field. So that's Fick's law. That's sort of Fick's first law. And physicists will be familiar with an, another equation that looks like this, which refers to electric fields and potentials. So the electric field is minus the gradient of the potential, the scalar potential. Seen that before? Yeah. Might have given it a different symbol, but V is the scalar potential in electrostatics. That's the electric field looks quite similar okay now recall from electrostatics Gauss's law not Gauss's theorem Gauss's law the integral of E dot ds over a closed surface is equal to Q divided by epsilon naught, remember that? And Q equals C times V charge equals capacitance times potential fairly straightforward analysis of electrostatics and capacitors so we can write Q over epsilon naught as, now I'm going to call C the electrostatic capacitance, I'm going to give that a subscript E for electrostatic. So C subscript E times V at the surface minus V at infinity. So all I'm doing now is I'm saying forget about vapour growth, let's imagine that we have this this surface, this hexagonal surface in an electric field and it's a conductor. So this surface would have capacitance CE, it's just a, a factor that depends on the shape, on the geometry of, the, of the, the hexagon and VS would be the surface potential measured on this hexagon and V infinity would be the potential, the, electro, the electrical potential <laughs> at infinity, okay? Divided by epsilon naught. And so by direct analogy, the, the equations look, the equations are very similar. I've got the, electri the electric field is minus the gradient of the scalar potential. <coughs> I've got the current density of mass, vapor mass is minus the gradient of the vapor density. So vapor density is like the electric potential. It's the scalar field. Current density is like the electric field. So by direct analogy, we can write that the integral of a closed surface of Jm dot ds, current density dot ds, is equal to the electrostatic potential potential 
divided by epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, which I'm not going to define because physicists, you're very familiar with that and you don't really need it because we're going to make a jump in just a minute and get rid of it, times the vapour density at the surface of the crystal minus the vapour density at infinity. So this equation is just like this equation, I've just substituted for E the current density and I've kept the right hand side. Now I'm going to define the electrostatic potential to be equal to 4 pi epsilon naught times C. <coughs> okay, don't worry about what that definition means, it's just a way of getting rid of the permittivity of free space epsilon naught because we're not talking about electric fields and scale of electrical scalar potentials so we don't actually need to consider the permittivity of free space I may as well get rid of it if I make that substitution then I can write that the right hand side is 4 pi c this capacitance that I've just defined here times rho infinity minus rho s okay and this j dot ds is minus the mass growth rate so I can write that the mass growth rate of the crystal dm by dt is equal to 4 pi times this capacitance times the difference between the scalar potential at infinity and the scalar potential vapour field, vapour density sorry, scalar vapour density at the surface of the crystal. Okay so this is a way of describing the, the, the growth rate of an ice crystal from the vapour. So there's been some fairly hand-waving arguments but the key to it was just making this direct analogy from electrostatics and so we can recall I should say recall recall that for a drop so this spherical particle the spherical drop we, cal we calculated we worked out that the mass growth rate for a drop was equal to 4 pi a, a is the radius, times vapor density at infinity minus vapor density at the surface of the drop. Looks quite similar. And the difference is that instead of the radius, we've got the capacitance now. And so I'm not going to go through all of the derivation that we went through for the drop, but it is in the notes if you're interested. But the final result is that for an ice crystal, that the growth rate, the mass growth rate, w turns out to be equal to 4 pi times the capacitance times the saturation ratio over ice minus 1 divided by a thermodynamic factor which depends on temperature and pressure. So that's exactly the same as for a drop, except that we've got, in place of radius, we've got capacitance, and for the drop, we have the saturation ratio over liquid, here we've got saturation over ice, and this thermodynamic factor is, slight, is slightly different, it's a slightly different function, you don't need to know what it is, but for the drop, I call that alpha rather than beta. So, it's just a function that depends on temperature and pressure. So I'm going to go through an example now. And now we're going to consider a hexagonal prism. Hex crystal. Looks like this. <coughs> 
This dimension is A, the dimension of an equilateral triangle. One side of the hexagon is A, and the depth of the hexagon is H. So the volume of this crystal is the area of a hexagon, 3 root 3 over 2, A squared, times the depth, which is H. And so the mass is the volume times the density. Now, rho subscript I, that's the density of ice, rho I, 920 kilograms per meter cubed. It's less dense than liquid water. And we make a change of variable find that the rate of change of dm by dt is equal to 3 root 3 over 2 times 2 a I should have said that we're considering the growth of this crystal in a plate regime so that means that the growth is not along the c-axis but the growth is on the a-axis so H remains constant. Treat H as a constant. A is the variable. Two to cancel. And so we can set this rate of change equal to the equation we derived for the growth rate of an ice crystal. 3 root 3 A H rho I dA by dt. So that's dm by dt and I'm going to set that now I'm going to set dm by dt equal to the right hand side here of this growth equation and there's a capacitance. Now the capacitance of a hexagonal prism can be approximated by C equals 2 pi over A uh, sorry, 2A over pi. Okay, so this remember capacitance is just a geometrical factor. So you can work, you can work out capacitance a uh, number of ways you can work it out by solving Laplace's equation. You can work it out by charging an inductor and, me and measuring the potential of that inductor. I guess you've all done that in ele electrical, electrostatic lab, no? Maybe. But it works out, take it from me, that the capacitance of this hexagonal crystal is 2A divided by pi. So we'll set the capacitance equal to 2A divided by pi. And we end up, when we cancel terms, we end up with something that looks like this. H dA by dt equals a bunch of constants. Divide by this thermodynamic factor and the solution so this can be solved quite easily H is a constant so it's basically dA by dt is a constant so it has solution that looks something like this A as a function of time is equal to A0 plus a bunch of constants Now this is the supersaturation, large S times T, and the supersaturation is equal to the saturation ratio minus one. That can be confusing. Okay, so supersaturation, if a particle's growing, it's greater than zero, the saturation ratio will be greater than one. So it looks like this. Now the bit you need to know. So I would expect you to be able to solve this differential equation. Oh, it's not. 
I would expect you to be able to solve this differential equation in the exam. So make sure you practice being able to do that. Um, what I'd like you to be able to discuss also is if we consider the growth of a particle starting here at time t equals zero and a particle starting here at time t equals zero, then this solution means that if we consider how much they grow after time t, and it looks like this. And so what that means is delta A at the start is equal to delta A at the end. So in terms of when we talked about a similar thing for cloud droplets, we found that the size of cloud droplets, the cloud droplet size distribution gets narrower with time. It goes narrower. Now for the ice crystal, we find we're finding that's not true. We find it, it does it does not get narrower. So the breadth of the distribution stays constant with time when we're considering the growth of a hexagonal plate in a plate regime. That makes sense. Okay. So just briefly, I was going to go through the weather. I'll, I'll just mention briefly that we might have some snow. So you might be seeing some of these processes in action. Um, but mainly on high ground tonight, and maybe some sleet on low ground by tomorrow. So that's quite interesting. And that's because there's westerly winds at the moment, and the, and the westerly winds are very cold. And as they come over the sea, the sea is still warmer than the air in the north. So that creates some instability. So that will create some showers, some cold winter showers, which will be advected over land. It will be transported over land. Okay. Oh. So just to finish off, so I won't talk about the cirrus clouds. I'll talk about these showers, which are the kinds of showers that we're going to be getting over the next few days. In that if you have, so this is to do with how ice nucleation affects these clouds and ice crystal growth. If you have few ice nuclei, then what tends to happen is the supercooled cloud persists. It does not precipitate. If you have more ice nuclei, you can have more ice and they can grow faster than the droplets and they can grow to larger sizes whereas the droplets tend to give you a narrow distribution this leads to more ice and more precipitation and I just thought I'd do a little computer simulation which is called simple cloud model don't worry about the details the three variables, there's cloud liquid water there's ice water and there's rain all of the equations in this model we've talked about over the last few lectures. So it's one dimension in the vertical, it solves for bulk microphysics, not bin microphysics, in layers. Condensation conserves the moist potential temperature, we talked about that in the first lecture. Rain and ice crystal growth is proportional to the first moment. So remember the um, growth of cloud droplets that's proportional to the first moment of the distribution. The growth of ice crystals, as I've shown today, is also proportional, proportional to the first moment, the size, because it's proportional to the capacitance, which is proportional to the size. And so, simulations from this simple cloud model, so this is as a function of height and time, and the contours here are cloud liquid water, and these are different simulations with different numbers of ice crystals in them. So 10 to the minus 4 per litre, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the